today, um, you know, I will uh, be presenting my my tutorial uh, seminar, and uh, as I'm already, you know, already read my title, title, but you know, my my tutorial will be on uh, solution NMR methods for uh, investigating uh, nanoparticle adsorption. And uh, but before we dive into into the actual um, into the actual tutorial, let me spend really a couple of minutes to tell you why we are interested in, uh, in, this, pro uh, in, uh, in this process, in this problem. So uh, in my group at Iowa State, we try to understand the relationship between uh, uh, conformational dynamics and more in general, molecular disorder and, uh, and catalysis. And, um, and we do so in uh, a series of uh, uh, biological and uh, non-biological catalysts. Uh, our model system for biological catalysis are bacterial enzyme one that catalyzes this autophosphorylation reaction here, and uh, the human RNA demethylases at the and LBH5 that catalyze you know, oxidative demethylation of uh, RNA. As for uh, uh, heterogeneous catalysis, uh, our model system is the uh, phenol hydrogenation reaction catalyzed by uh, palladium on, uh, on Syrian nanoparticle. Uh, and uh, for what concern, I mean, the, you know, the, this last problem, this last uh, section of our research, heterogeneous catalysis, you know, the, the kind of re uh, the questions that our research is, uh, is asking are the following. So how many, uh, how many unique absorption sites we have on a catalyst? Which is the absorption site that is competent for catalysis? And how do the, um, the kinetics and thermodynamics of absorption affect catalysis? And what is the absorption mechanism? So just to be more specific, uh, in the uh, palladium on Syria um, catalyst that we are investigating, so uh, how many different interactions, uh, interaction modes phenol can have with, the, with this nanoparticle, right? So we can imagine, I don't know, phenol hydrogen bonding to the Syria, binding to an oxygen vacancy on the Syria, binding uh, on the palladium uh, site of our nanoparticle. And which of this binding mode is actually responsible for catalytic conversion? And how does phenol uh, absorb on, uh, on that specific site? These are the kind of questions that we are trying to address using a solution NMR. What's the problem though when we try to apply a solution NMR uh, to such a system, right? Uh, when we try to apply solution NMR to the characterization of uh, um, a small molecule ligand binding to a nanoparticle surface. So the problem is that often, well, almost all the times, we're not able to see, to observe the bound state. Okay, so here I'm showing some simulated NMR spectra for a, a small molecule ligand in equilibrium on the slowest change regime uh, between a disorbed state, a free state, state A, and a nanoparticle bound state, absorbed state that we call state B. Okay, so uh, we assume that the uh, transverse relaxation rate for the free state is about 10 per second, so more than a small molecule, probably a small protein. And, uh, and the, uh, the bound state, the R2 for the bound state is about 100 per second, or in this other example, 1000 per second. And you can see that even if, uh, uh, if uh, uh, our two uh, states are equally populated, so we have 50% of our small molecule is in uh, the desorbed state and 50% of the small molecule is in the uh, absorbed state, and we are in the slowest change regime, we can barely, I mean, we cannot observe Basically, uh, the signal of uh, uh, of the bound state because it would be uh, under uh, would be under the experimental noise, the um, spectral noise. So, how do we do that? So, in NMR, uh, in solution NMR, what we do, we take advantage of the um, conformation of the um, chemical exchange of, um, between state A and state B to imprint information on the bound state into the spectrum of the free state that we can actually observe by uh, solution NMR. So uh, before we uh, start um, introducing the, the methods, the solution NMR methods that we use in order to, uh, to achieve this, let's look at how um, the exchange between the desorbed and absorbed states affects the signal of uh, state A, of our uh, desorbed state, okay? So here, uh, I'm showing uh, the simulated NMR spectra uh, for, uh, uh, for uh, an, um, a small molecule in exchange between the desorbed state A with, again, an R2 of about 10 per second, 
and uh, an absorbed state uh, B with an uh, R2 of about um, you know, 100 per second. The population of the two states are taken to be 50% uh, uh, state A, 50% state B in this you know, uh, far more uh, um, in this um, example on the, on, on the left. Here in this other uh, example, so the, the equilibrium is considered to be skewed uh, toward the, um, um, the free state. So we have a 99% free state, 1% bound state, okay? Uh, going from bottom to top, uh, I'm uh, uh, increasing the exchange rate. So we go from the slow exchange regime. So our small molecule is exchanging slowly from the free state to the bound state and vice versa. Uh, to the fast exchange regime at the top. So the exchange is fast between the two species, between the two states, okay? So starting from the, uh, from the, uh, slow, um, the slow exchange regime, sorry, somebody's calling me, of course, now, let me. <laughs> so, uh, not disturb, sorry. So, and, uh, uh, okay, so if we start from the slow exchange regime, um, uh, we can see that, of course, in the slow exchange regime, we will have two NMR signal, one for the free state, the other for the bound state, and uh, the R2 for uh, the observed um, for uh, for the observed signal, right, for a state A, uh, will be given by the intrinsic R2 of the free state, so the, the R2 of the small molecule in the absence of uh, of any exchange or in the absence of nanoparticle plus uh, a contribution that we usually call lifetime line broadening, uh, which is due to the exchange with a species with, a, uh, with a, a larger molecular weight, with a larger R2, okay? If we are in the fast exchange regime, we do not observe two signals, right? We, don't, we only observe one single signal at the population weighted chemical shift. Okay, and these signals will also have a population a population weighted R2, right? The R2, the observed R2 for this signal will be um, the average, the population average R2 of state A uh, and state B, okay? However, we usually, uh, we, uh, mm, we refer to these observed R2 in reference to the R2 of the free state. Okay, so more often, instead of using this equation to refer to, refer to the R2, to the observed R2, we, re, uh, we use this other equation down here, okay, in which the observed R2 is seen as the R2 of the free state, R2A, plus again, this uh, lifetime line broadening, this contribution due to the exchange uh, with um, a species with a higher R2 rates, okay? If we are in the intermediate uh, exchange regime, now our observed R2, the R2 uh, for our observed signal uh, will be uh, given by, would be uh, affected by two contribution, right? We're gonna have the, uh, the uh, lifetime line broadening contribution coming from uh, the exchange with the species with, the, with a higher R2 rate, plus we have the exchange contribution to the R2, which is coming from, uh, um, um, the exchange on the micro to millisecond time scale in this intermediate exchange regime uh, between two species with different chemical shift, okay? So what I want to uh, stress out now is that uh, while the uh, exchange contribution to the R2 comes from a difference in chemical shift between state A and state B, the lifetime line broadening contribution comes from the exchange between two species with different R2, okay? So this uh, lifetime line broadening contribution is observed even if the difference in chemical shift between the two states is zero, okay? That's very important to remember. So uh, therefore, I mean, we can see that even if we cannot directly observe the, um, uh, you know, the bound state in, uh, in solution, the NMR signal of, uh, uh, of the visible state, uh, it is strongly affected by the interaction so that we can detect the interaction uh, just looking at, you know, the NMR signal of the, um, that is left in solution, the observable NMR signal, okay? 
And uh, um, the extent at which this uh, signal is affected by the interaction, of course, depends on the parameters of, uh, of this interaction. We have seen that depends on, uh, on the, um, um, the exchange regime. It depends on the populations uh, of the free and bound state. Usually, the higher is the population of the bound state. And you know the the larger is the effect, uh, the observable effect on the visible state, on the visible signal. It also depends on uh, um, also depends on uh, uh, the R two of the bound state. Okay, so if the R two of the bound state is small, okay, is relatively small, let's say one hundred per second in this example, in order to see an observable effect on our visible signal, we have to crank up the population to higher value, right? The, the PB, the population of the bound state to higher value. However, if, we, uh, if uh, the R2 of the bound state is, is very large, like for example, 1,000 per second, and this can be because you know, our molecule binds to the nanoparticle very rigidly, or because the nanoparticle is very big, so it tumbles, the complex tumbles very slowly uh, in solution, then even uh, uh, a tiny uh, population for the bound state would be observable uh, in the NMR signal. So the bottom line is that uh, you, when you prepare your NMR sample, you really want to, uh, to adjust the amount of nanoparticle uh, that you add uh, in solution uh, in order to, uh, to achieve an observable effect on the visible state, on the visible uh, NMR signal, without uh, completely broadening out right, your, your NMR line. So you really need to adjust uh, your uh, your sample condition, and that needs to be done specifically for each system that you are investigating. However, once you you are able to get a a, a sample, right, uh, um, that you know that uh, in which you can observe, you know, this uh, um, the the effect of the interaction on the visible NMR state. Then we have a portfolio of, uh, uh, of, uh, of NMR experiments, uh, ligand detected NMR experiments that can be applied to characterize you know, this um, um, ab nanoparticle absorption, ligand absorption on, uh, on, on nanoparticle surfaces. And uh, here I'm reporting uh, a few of them. Okay? So you can see that um, some, some of these experiments, so the choice of the experiment really depends on uh, the exchange regime in which we are in and also depends on uh, the physiochemical properties of, uh, of your uh, system under investigation, right? So, so uh, it would depend on how soluble your nanoparticle is, you know, what kind of solvents you can, uh, you can use for, um, um, you know, resuspend your small molecule and nanoparticle and so on, okay? Uh, and again, it depends on, uh, on the, um, the specific exchange regime that you are in. If you are in the fast exchange regime, you probably want to use chemical ship perturbation. If you are in, uh, in the slow exchange regime, you probably want to use uh, analysis of peak intensity. Um, we can see here, these are, uh, these are uh, saturation um, transfer type of experiment, SCD and DES. They work better in, uh, um, in the slow exchange regime. We have relaxation dispersion type of experiments that work better in, uh, um, in the intermediate exchange regime and so on. We currently have a, a review under, under revision now in which we describe in great detail each experiment uh, shown here. Um, today, I do not have the time to describe all of them. So I will just focus on the DEST experiment and the uh, CPMG uh, relaxation dispersion type of experiment, which is you know, the, the, the two experiments that we apply the most in, uh, in my group to study um, uh, surface absorption. Okay, so let's start with uh, uh, the um, CPMG relaxation dispersion experiment. Um, this experiment became very, very uh, popular in the um, investigation of, uh, um, of conformational equilibria in proteins, conformational equilibria that occur on the micro to millisecond time scale. And this experiment was made popular mostly by the work of uh, uh, Lewis Kay and Art Palmer. Um, so in here, I'm showing the pulse sequence that we use in my group uh, to study, to um, acquire 1D carbon CPMG uh, experiments. 
uh, on um, small molecule nanoparticle systems. If you want, you can download, uh, um, um, you know, the Pulse program in Brooker format uh, from our website. Uh, but anyway, so it's pretty uh, basic pulse sequence. What we do, I mean, we apply, uh, we have an inep to, uh, an inep to uh, block to generate um, some transverse carb carbon magnetization. Then here we have the CPMG block, and then we have a retro inep for uh, um, acquisition of proton. So, um, you know, the magic is performed by uh, the CPMG block in which our transverse ma magnetization is, um, um, under, uh, undergoes a series of uh, uh, 180 degree refocusing pulses spaced by a delay uh, two tau uh, that you can see here. So in, uh, um, in um, a conventional uh, relaxation dispersion experiment, what we do, we build this relaxation dispersion curve uh, that consists in uh, a series of R2 measured using uh, the sequence at different value of tau. Okay, so here basically I'm plotting the R2 versus the CPMG field. So the CPMG field is equal to one over four tau. Uh, therefore, I mean, high CPMG field will correspond to a, a small value of tau. Low CPMG field will correspond to a long delay tau. Okay, uh, so if uh, our system undergoes a conformational equilibrium between two states, a and B with different chemical shift, and the equilibrium occurs on, on the uh, micro to millisecond time scale regime, uh, in the relaxation dispersion curve, uh, we will have a curvature. And the reason is that, you know, um, increasing the CPMG field, we are able in this condition, when uh, the system undergoes a change under this condition, increasing the CPMG field, we are able to progressively suppress the exchange contribution to, trans to the transverse relaxation rate, okay? So that we will introduce this curvature in the, uh, in the relaxation dispersion curve. And the exchange contribution to the R2 could be in theory measured by taking the difference in R2 between the R2 measured the low CPMG field and the R2 measured the high CPMG field. Of course, if your system, our system doesn't undergo conformational equilibrium in this exchange uh, regime, or if delta omega, so the difference in chemical shift between state A and state B is zero, then we will observe a flat, uh, a flat line, no curvature in the relaxation dispersion curve. So if we now move to uh, the analysis of, uh, uh, of uh, a small molecule nanoparticle system, we have two contributions, right? So we have the exchange contribution to uh, the, uh, the relaxation rate that can be suppressed by increasing the CPMG field. And we have the uh, lifetime line broadening, right? That uh, is not affected by, uh, by the CPMG field. So if we compare, the relaxation dispersion uh, curve measured in the absence of, an, of nanoparticles, so here in blue would be the relaxation dispersion curve observed for just the ligand, so for just state A in the absence of nanoparticles. So we see a very, uh, we see a flat uh, relaxation dispersion curve because there is no interaction uh, going on, okay? There is no equilibrium, um, exchange equilibrium going on. So we see a flat curve, okay? Then we reacquire the experiment, but now in the presence of our nanoparticles, in this case, we will have both lifetime line broadening that will, in, uh, that will shift, right? Our full relaxation dispersion curve to a, higher, uh, to a higher R2 rate, and we will have this change contribution that will introduce a curvature uh, into our uh, relaxation dispersion curve, right? So comparing the blue curve and the red curve, we can measure both lifetime line broadening and a change contribution to the relaxation rate. Turns out that the shape of uh, our relaxation dispersion curve uh, really depends on uh, the, uh, the kinetics and thermodynamics parameter of, uh, of, our, um, of our equilibrium, okay? Uh, therefore, even modeling the relaxation, the shape of the relaxation dispersion curve is a big source of information, right? Um, for the thermodynamics and kinetics of our, uh, of our nanoparticle absorption process. So how do we do that? So in order to, to model 
the um, uh, you know relaxation uh, dispersion profile, what we do we use uh, uh, you know the block McConnell theory, right, to simulate the effect uh, of um, perturbations such as you know the chemical shift relaxation, um, um, transverse relaxation, and, um, and, uh, and um, the kinetics of the equilibrium on the transverse magnetization of state A during, uh, during the, um, the CPMG experiment, okay? And a script, the MATLAB script that, you know, solves this math, it's, you know, there are several of these scripts or programs that solve this, you know, the block, uh, the block McConnell equation. Uh, one of them is provided even you know, by, by our group. So you can download our script um, from um, our MATLAB script from our um, group web page. Okay. So uh, what are the relevant, um, the, re the relevant matrices here? So what, it, you know, what, what are the relevant parameters entering? So in this R matrix here, these are the perturbations that are applied uh, to our magnetization during, you know, the CPMG uh, block. Okay, so and my mouse is well, okay now. It's working again. So and uh, these are, you know, the three uh, relevant matrices. Okay, in this, um, when you read this matrix, okay, so one easy way or you know one one figurative way that you can apply is that each row, right? Will refer to uh, a particular um, active uh, um, to, to a particular active state. Okay, so if you go here, you can see that the first row will refer to the to state A. Second row in each matrix will refer to state B. Okay. So uh, in this uh, uh, RCS matrix, what we uh, what we input basically what we have we have the, um, the chemical shift difference between some reference state and our active state, okay? So in the first row, so if we take uh, as, um, as um, um, the reference state, let's say state A, so the first row on the diagonal, we will have the chemical shift difference between our active state for the first row is state A and our reference state that we took A as a reference state, so it would be zero, right? Because it would be the same chemical shift. On the second row in, on the diagonal, so we will have the chemical shift difference between the active state, in this case, state B, right? We are in the second row and our reference state, and which again is state A. So in the, in the diagonal, we will have the chemical shift difference between state A and state B. In this relaxation matrix on the diagonal, we will have uh, uh, the, um, rela the transverse relaxation rate for our active states, okay? so. For the first row, our active state is state A. So we'll, on the diagonal, we have the R2 for state A. On uh, the second row, we have on the diagonal, so the active state is state B. So on the, uh, on the diagonal, we have the R2 for state B. In the exchange matrix, what we have, we have the, uh, the rate constant, right, for uh, uh, the uh, exchange equilibrium. In particular, on the diagonal, we have the rate that takes magnetization away from our active state. Again, for the, for the first row, the active state is state A. So on the diagonal, we have the rate that takes away magnetization from state A. So the KAB, or K on, will take magnetization from A to B, right? So it's taking magnetization away from state A, so it will be on the diagonal. For the second row on the diagonal, we have KBA because the active state is state B. And so we have on the diagonal, the rate that takes magnetization away from B, from B into A, right? Off diagonal are uh, the, uh, the rates for those processes that take magnetization into the active state, okay? So for the first row, the active state is state A. So off diagonal, we have KBA that is taking magnetization from B into A, right? And for uh, the second row, right, we have KAB. So the, um, the rate for the process that is taking magnetization from A into B. Okay, so when basically what we do uh, in, um, in a conventional experiment, we acquire some relaxation dispersion data experimentally, and then we use the block uh, McConnell uh, theory to try to uh, optimize these parameters uh, so that our simulated curve matches our experimental data uh, you know, as close as possible, okay? 
So usually uh, R2A, it's, it's the, the transverse relaxation of, uh, uh, of uh, state A that can be measured experimentally, simply measuring the R2 in the absence of nanoparticle. So this is something that we can measure experimentally and you know, input um, input directly into the matrix as a number, not as a floatable parameter. Usually the other uh, parameters are optimized uh, by uh, a feeding procedure. So once we have obtained the kinetic parameters for our, uh, for our equilibrium, we can apply the following two equations, right, uh, to uh, measure, to actually um, calculate the thermodynamic population PA and PB, right? So you can see that by solving uh, the block McConnell equation, uh, we obtain uh, we obtain important information on uh, uh, on the um, on the thermodynamics and absorb and uh, and kinetics of the absorption process. We get you know k on k off and populations for uh, uh, for the two states uh, A and B, and we also get. Uh, information, important information, more structural information, such as you know the R2 of the bound state and the change in chemical shift uh, going from state A to state B. Another important aspect of this block McConnell theory is that um, you know we can expand uh, these matrices in order to account for a more complicated um, um, absorption mechanisms. Okay, so the idea is always the same, but you know we can uh, we can include you know a third state, for example, state C, into the picture, and uh, and um, and again we can simply expand the matrices by incorporating this additional state. I just want to point out in the uh, in the um, exchange matrix here, you can see again on the diagonal we have all the rates that take magnetization away from the active state. For example, first row would be state A, right? So the, uh, the processes that take away magnetization from state A would be K, A, B, right? We're going from A to B and K, A, C, A. We're going from A to C, right? Off diagonal are all the processes that are bringing magnetization into A, B, A, and C, A. But otherwise, I mean, the, uh, the way we build this matrix is, is exactly the same, okay? So uh, again, so what is, the, uh, what is the advantages of using these methods? The advantages is that we, uh, we get information on the kinetics and thermodynamics of the, of the absorption. We obtain uh, information on the uh, R2B and uh, so the, the R2 of the bound state, and we obtain information on the chemical shift that we will see in a bit. Um, this, this information can be used to derive structural models on how these uh, small molecules bind to the nanoparticle. There are, of course, some cons, okay? So uh, you can see from, uh, uh, from this picture here that if we are in, uh, um, if we are in very, the slowest change or in very fastest change, our relaxation dispersion curve um, profile is, loses its curvature. So we do not get a lot of uh, information uh, out of these experiments, out of this feeding, because you know, we have a lot of degenerate results when, uh, when this happens. And of, also these, uh, these experiments also require acquisition of relaxation dispersion curves and multiple um, static field or multiple instruments in order to, um, to get very stable fits. Uh, so might be an experiment that is quite time consuming. So these are uh, the two main cons uh, of this relaxation uh, dispersion um, uh, type of experiment. So the other method that I wanted to, to introduce is the, the, uh, is the DEST or a dark side exchange saturation transfer. This is a method that was introduced by Marius Klor, Dennis Torcha and my buddy and Nick Fauci. Uh, initially for investigating uh, the um, mm, aggregation of uh, the uh, A-beta uh, and later on was applied to um, a bunch of systems in which we have an NMR visible state. So something that, you know, some relatively small molecule that gives a sharp NMR signal that we can actually see in exchange with a dark state, an NMR dark state. It would be, uh, you know, a state with a, a very large molecular weight that is slowly, uh, that is tumbling very slowly in solution, and therefore gives a very broad signal that we cannot observe uh, by NMR because it would be within noise. Okay, so how does this technique works? This technique 
were, uh, exploits the large difference in R2 between the free state, between the visible state and the dark state to selectively saturate the bound state, the state that we cannot directly observe, okay? So um, then, you know, when once, you know, our bound state, our dark state is uh, selectively uh, saturated, the saturation is transferred again into the visible state, into the free state by chemical exchange so that we can detect the saturation on the signal of the free molecule, right? That's, uh, that's how this works. This is the pulse sequence that we use for 1D carbon dust uh, in my lab. And again, you can download it at our website. Um, but basically what we do again, we use an inept to get you know, carbon magnetization, this 90 degree pulse to go on, uh, on, uh, on the Z axis. Then we apply this saturation block uh, and, uh, and then, we, um, and then we, we go back on proton for acquisition. Um, ideally, so when, what we do, we want to build a, a death profile that is built by measuring death experiment, um, several death experiment by scanning, you know, the offset of the saturation, uh, of, the sa uh, of the saturation field um, through the, the spectral window, okay? So ideally, if, um, if uh, we do not have uh, any dark state, for example, if we acquire a death profile in the absence of nanoparticle, so we only have our small molecule, there is no, there is no dark state, Right, we will only saturate our uh, our signal, our visible signal, when we are on top of you know the, the visible signal. Right, when when we we, we are at the same frequency uh, as our uh, small molecule. Okay, so we see a very narrow dip in the dash profile. Okay, however, in the presence of a of a broad line coming from this you know dark state that is in exchange uh, with our visible state, we can saturate the broad line. Of, uh, uh, of the dark state, even when we are very far off resonance compared to the visible state. Then of course the saturation is, uh, is transferred to the visible state by chemical exchange, and we will be able to observe a reduction in signal of the visible state uh, in the presence of the dark state. So in this case, we will expect a much broader death profile in which we are able to saturate our visible state signal even when we are very far off resonance. Once again, you know, the idea is that we measure, we measure the, uh, this experimental death profile, and then we want to model them using the block uh, McConnell equation in order to uh, obtain uh, kinetics and uh, thermodynamics parameters of, uh, on, on the exchange process. So in this case, you know, the, uh, we have many more perturbations uh, in, uh, that we are introducing in our system. So uh, the, the, we have to consider many more matrices, okay? We have to consider, you know, the perturbation to our uh, magnetization introduced by, you know, the saturation uh, um, uh, RF, by the kinetics of the equilibrium, by relaxation, and uh, by you know uh, the chemical shift uh, evolution. Okay, so um, in this case, we can see we have to account for the x, y, and z magnetization of state A, and uh, x, y, and z magnetization of state Z uh, of sorry of state B. Uh, but okay, so the way we we read this uh, uh, this matrices is is identical uh, as, as we've done before for, uh, for the CPMG relaxation dispersion. Um, I just wanted to, uh, to point out here that the, um, that, you know, the, um, the strength of the saturation field is an experimental parameter. So it's something that we know, right, uh, in advance. So it, these are not um, um, floatable, floatable opti um, optimized parameter by the feed. It's something that we know and we can just uh, fix into, uh, into this matrix. We just put the numbers into these matrices. Um, um, also, same for R2A, R2A and R1A. These are uh, the transversal longitudinal relaxation for, uh, um, for uh, the visible state A that can be measured experimentally by measuring R1 and R2 in the absence of nanoparticle. For what concern uh, omega A and omega B, these are, um, these are basically the offset of state A and state B uh, with respect to the saturation, uh, to the saturation field. 
um, of course, we do know this for omega A because we do know where uh, usually, well, if we are not in fastest change, or I mean, we do know it because we do know, um, we, we can acquire the data right in the absence of nanoparticles to know where the chemical shift of state A would be. But what concerns state B, it turns out that the DEST is, um, uh, is usually a very low resolution experiment. So in theory, omega B can be optimized, but usually we tend to set it you know, equal to omega A be just because you know, the DEST is, is very low resolution. Uh, and, and so, I mean, there is no real gain in optimizing omega B, but that's something, of course, you can decide yourself. Uh, another important point to stress out is that here you can see that we have the equilibrium magnetization of state A and state B. Uh, and, uh, um, you know, you have, to pay, you have to pay attention on the type of sequence that you use when you, when you um, set up these parameters. Uh, because if you use an, in, an inept, right? Uh, if you use an, uh, an, inept, an inept sequence, right? So the starting magnetization MAZ and uh, MZB at time zero, right, would be proportional to uh, the population difference of protons, right? However, the equilibrium magnetization, right, would be proportional to the, you know, the equilibrium magnetization of carbon. So usually this value would be uh, one fourth uh, of, uh, uh, of the initial value of the magnetization. This is something you have to pay attention to. So anyway, so at the end of the day, when we get, uh, when, uh, when we, uh, we measure our uh, DES profile and we optimize the DES profile using uh, the block McConnell theory, we are able to obtain a, a bunch of uh, kinetics and thermodynamics parameter for our, uh, for our equilibrium. We obtain structural information in the forms of uh, R1 and R2 uh, for the bound species. Um, we also got, uh, we also get, um, um, sorry, uh, we do not get uh, chemical shift information uh, because the uh, the dust uh, the dust experiments, as I said, it's a, it's a low resolution experiment. Okay, other pros of uh, of uh, uh, of the uh, dust experiment is that doesn't need protons on the receptor, doesn't need protons on the nanoparticle, like you know saturation transfer type of experiments, uh, and uh, can detect very low population of the bound state, assuming that. The R2B is very large. Okay, so the higher is the R2B, and the higher is the sensitivity of the death. So the darker basically is the dark state, and the more sensitive is the experiment. Okay, and is applicable to a relatively wide range of Kx, even though a very uh, a very uh, high Kx. Um, quanti quantitative interpretation of uh, of the death uh, can be can be tricky. Okay, so the quantitative interpretation of this works best at, uh, at um, in the intermediate to slow um, exchange regime. Okay, so for what concern uh, the cons, again, is a low resolution experiment. So no, no much information on delta omega from the change in chemical shift going from state A to state B. Um, you know, requires the, uh, the exchange rate constant to be larger than, uh, than R1. Uh, right, because you need uh, you need to go into the dark state, saturate the dark state, and then come back into the visible state. So you don't want your magnetization to be completely relaxed before you come back into the visible state. Uh, again, it's not quantitative. We are in the very fastest change regime. And something you have to pay attention is that it's very you know can be affected quite a bit by spin diffusion. So you don't want to acquire proton dust. Okay. So the reason to to stick to heteronuclei is that. Um, to do carbon death or nitrogen death in the case of proteins is that death is very uh, strongly affected by spin diffusion. So you don't want to acquire a proton death experiment. Bottom line is that uh, you know we can uh, we can combine our uh, we can combine uh, um, uh, you know saturation transfer. Uh, sorry, we can combine death experiment with CPMG. Right and get information and um, detect and characterize sorption equilibria that are uh, that are occurring on uh, a pretty wide uh, range of time scales. Okay. Also, the advantage of combining the two experiments is that you can see they kind of 
depend uh, on uh, similar um, thermodynamics and kinetics parameters. So combining the two experiments together and feeding all the data together really helps the feed to converge to, uh, to a single solution, okay? Another important uh, uh, aspect, uh, as I mentioned a few times uh, now of uh, um, you know, modeling this dust and uh, relaxation dispersion experiments it, is that we obtain structural inv information in, uh, in terms of uh, um, 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 longitudinal and transverse relax relaxation rate for the bound state R2B, okay? Indeed, uh, what we can do once we have um, values for R1 uh, R R1B and R2B, Right, so we can model this longitudinal and, uh, and relaxation rates of, uh, of the bound state using uh, the model free approach, okay? Uh, to, to obtain information on, on the order parameter of, uh, uh, of uh, um, this uh, spin system that we are uh, analyzing. For example, um, here uh, we have the equation so uh, to, um, to link the R1 and the carbon R1 and R2 for uh, isolated uh, CH bond vectors, such as the, one, uh, the ones that we have in, uh, in phenol, to relate these R1 and R2, carbon R1 and R2 uh, to the order parameters. And similar equations can be developed even for more, more complicated uh, um, uh, spin system, and they are there in the literature already. Okay, uh, so what is, the, um, what is the advantage of doing so? The advantage of doing so is that if we, if based on uh, our uh, R1 and R2 of the bound state, we obtain an order parameter, which is close to one, we know that our CH bond vector, you know, that uh, is uh, uh, tumbling with the same correlation time as the nanoparticle. Okay, therefore we know that our CH bond vector is rigidly attached to the nanoparticle. If we obtain uh, an order parameter, which is uh, similar, you know, close to zero or a small order parameter, then we know that our CH bond vector is flexible with respect to the nanoparticle. Okay, and therefore, I mean, based on, uh, on this value, we can start uh, making assumption on the way our small molecule uh, binds to the, to the nanoparticle surface. So uh, after I've introduced all the, these techniques, I want just to use the last five, five minutes uh, to, to show you how you can, uh, you know, a, a more applied uh, example to, to really show you how um, these techniques can be, uh, can be applied to solve um, something more practical, right? Uh, and we're gonna make the example uh, uh, we're going to use as an example, you know, the phenol absorption on uh, on uh, palladium on the palladium on Syria nanoparticle. As I mentioned before, uh, this nanoparticle palladium on Syria is in presence of hydrogen is able to reduce phenol into cyclohexanone and cyclohexanone. So uh, this is a study that we have performed in collaboration with uh, uh, the Igor's Lowing group in the Ames lab. And uh, Igor's group is responsible for uh, the synthesis and catalytic characterization of, uh, of this nanoparticle. We are responsible for, uh, for the NMR side of, uh, of, of the project. Uh, so the nanoparticle that we are analyzing are uh, basically a Syrian nanoparticle of cubic morpho morphology, about 25 nanometers diameter. And on top of this nanoparticle, you can see here, these darker spots are uh, palladium sites of about uh, two nanometer. Uh, they're deposited on, uh, on this Syria support, okay? This looks like more of, you know, like a chocolate chip, like uh, cookie, right? In which, you know, the, uh, the palladium would be the chocolate, right? And the Syria would be the cookie. Okay, so in our naive idea, we thought, okay, so we just resuspend, we just uh, add um, phenol to a suspension of these nanoparticles. We go to the NMR, we measure these ligand detected NMR uh, experiments, we model them, and we get the answer that we want. Turns out that the situation is a, is a little bit more complicated. Indeed, um, nanoparticles usually do not like to, to stay in suspension. They 
impacts over the time, they will sediment at the bottom of uh, the NMR tube. And this was causing serious problem to the stability of our NMR experiments. You can see already after 30 minutes, uh, you know, the NMR signal was changing because of uh, this nanoparticle sedimentation. And so, of course, this, this is not a good behavior if we want to measure uh, extensive sets of tests and relaxation dispersion experiment with accuracy. So our solution was to develop uh, a series of, um, of uh, uh, gelators. Now, okay, here I just say aqueous gel. Now we have gelators that work, that work even for organic solvent. But anyway, our gelators uh, uh, that you can find uh, here in these two publications uh, are uh, able to trap the nanoparticle in suspensions so that we can now acquire very stable uh, NMR uh, signal even uh, over you know, 30 days. Okay, and we have therefore enough time to acquire accurate sets of uh, relaxation dispersion and death experiments. So using this methodology, so we have for a sample preparation, so we have, uh, we have measured then uh, um, um, carbon dust, carbon CPMG and proton CPMG for uh, uh, phenol in the absence and in the presence of nanoparticle. So the data in the absence of nanoparticle are shown as uh, uh, crosses here. You can see here and here. So are all, the, all the crosses are in the uh, data are measured in the absence of nanoparticle. When we add the nanoparticle, we remeasure the data and now we show the data as circles, okay? Uh, on the left panel, I'm showing the data measured for just the serious, in the presence of just the serious support. On the right side, I'm showing the data uh, measured on the palladium and cerium nanoparticle. Okay, in both cases, you can see that in, we can detect the interaction using these methods. It, in fact, you can see that you know the death profile got wider but broader when we add the nanoparticle. The relaxation dispersion, both relaxation dispersion curves, I mean, went up, right? Uh, because of the lifetime line broadening, and also especially the, the relaxation dispersion curves measured for protons show this, um, this, this curvature, right, uh, which will indicate an exchange contribution to the relaxation rate, okay? Uh, and you can see that these observations are true for both uh, nanoparticle systems. So of course, though, you know, the, the real power of these experiments is in, uh, in modeling experimental data to obtain you know, kinetics and thermodynamics information on, uh, on, uh, on, the, on the interaction, okay? And uh, we have done so, you know, these are, this is the modeling for uh, the data measured in the presence of the Syrian nanoparticle, okay? So you can see here in uh, uh, these dashed lines are the modeling using a two-sided exchange uh, equilibrium. And you can see that this two-sided exchange equilibrium is not a good model for our system. You can see that we are not able to model you know, the relaxation dispersion profile very accurately using a two-sided exchange model. But we have to use a three-sided exchange model uh, to uh, fit, to reproduce our experimental data. Okay, so uh, the parameters obtained for this three-sided exchange model are uh, obtained here. They are shown here. You can see that we can measure, uh, we obtain you know, K on, or K forward and K reverse for uh, each equilibrium. I want to say that K forward and reverse for uh, the equilibrium that goes from state A to state C was zero in both cases. So we just um, show the equilibrium as a, a linear, um, uh, the, this three-step equilibrium as a linear uh, equilibrium in which we go from state E, from state A to state C through state B, okay? Uh, we also got populations for uh, the three states, okay? And what is important, I mean, we also got, uh, based on the uh, relaxation rates for, uh, uh, you know, the phenol bound to state B and state C, we could, go, we could get order parameters, right, for uh, the CH bond vectors uh, in, uh, in these two different states. For state B, we get the same uh, order parameters for the ortho, meta, and para position, and we get an order parameter very close to zero for the three positions of, phen uh, of phenol. And this would be consistent with a very disordered 
binding mode, okay, in which you know the uh, the uh, the three position are all very flexible with respect to the nanoparticle surface. So we think that this uh, that this um, uh, order parameter would be consistent uh, with hydrogen bonding of phenol uh, to the surface of Syria. You can see that now we have three rotatable bonds that will give plenty of uh, conformational freedom uh, to this three position of uh, of uh, of, um, of, phen of phenol. For what concerns the binding mode uh, uh, C, though, we have three different order parameters. So for the ortho and meta position, we get an order parameters of about order parameters of zero. For the para position, we get an order parameter of one. And this is causing, right? So you can see the carbon 13 R2 of the para position to be much higher than the ortho and meta. Okay. Uh, so what happens here is that basically. Uh, you know, the ortho and meta position are reorienting very quickly with respect to the nanoparticle. However, you know, the, the para position is rigid with respect to the nanoparticle. And I think we believe that this is consistent with uh, uh, this binding mode here in which phenol is uh, binding to the, an oxygen vacancy on the Syria support. In this case, we only have one rotatable bond. And for uh, our solid state folks, I mean, you can see that, you know, the ortho and meta position and meta position are basically rotating at the, uh, the magic angle with respect to the nanoparticle, uh, you know, uh, with respect to the nanoparticle, why the para position uh, would be rigid with respect to the nanoparticle because rotation above this bond doesn't reorient uh, the CH uh, bond vector with respect to the nanoparticle surface. So we could do the same exercise now for, uh, uh, for the palladium on Syria nanoparticle. Again, uh, we get uh, K forward and reverse for each uh, equilibrium. But now what is interesting is, is again, that we obtain uh, you know, an uh, order parameter for the ortho, meta, and para position in this, uh, in this um, uh, state B, which is close to zero, again, consistent with this uh, hydrogen bonding type of uh, uh, interaction. But for, uh, uh, for uh, state C, now we obtain uh, an identical order parameter for the three, uh, for uh, the ortho, meta, and para position. Uh, and this order parameter is close to one, meaning that you know, the, uh, you know, all these bond vectors are rotating at the same correlation time as the nanoparticles, so are moving as a single body with the rest of the nanoparticle. And we believe this is consistent with a, 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 the a binding of phenol flat on, uh, on the surface of uh, uh, the metal side, which was uh, suggested by a Venetian calculation by uh, another group. So uh, I want to skip this, but you know, um, another thing, you know, uh, um, that we could, uh, um, we could do, you know, of course, I mean, we wanted to test uh, our, that our binding modes were, were correct. And the way we did it is by adding, uh, adding um, phosphate to our, uh, to our solution and reacquiring all our data in the presence of 20 millimolar phosphate. Uh, phosphate is known to interact very strongly with the Syria support, but to not have a lot of interaction with the palladium side. Therefore, we were expecting uh, phosphate to disrupt uh, at least partially, you know, the interaction between phenol and Syria and do not affect the interaction between phenol and the palladium side. And by repeating our experiment, modeling the data, this is indeed uh, what we have, uh, uh, what we have found. So we have found that you can see, so adding phosphate, um, we disrupt binding of phenol to the Syria support. In the case of, you know, uh, binding of just the Syria nanotube, we can see that this hydrogen bonded interaction goes from 5.2% to 2.5% population. And uh, you know, this uh, um, binding to the oxygen vacancy is almost completely disrupted. I and mean, we, we, cannot, we cannot detect it anymore, basically, uh, by our method. For what concern uh, the, uh, you know, the palladium in Syria, by adding phosphate, we can see that we cut the population of this hydrogen bonded state almost you know, by 50%, going from 2.3 to 1.6%. However, we do not affect binding uh, to, the, to the palladium side, which, which is consistent with you know, this uh, suggested binding mode. Um, we were also able to, to do some, uh, uh, to, uh, 
to use our data to um, to um, uh, investigate or uh, to address the question of which is the binding mode that is more uh, relevant for catalysis. But uh, I already uh, went over time, so I'm, I will not I will not talk about this this last topic. This is just a last example, uh, and I'm gonna stop here for questions. Uh, thank you so much for that uh, really nice talk. Uh, so uh, with that, maybe uh, we can get into the questions. Uh, there is one in the Q and A window. I don't know if uh, you can already see the question mentioned, so if you can pull your Q and A window open, but I'm happy to read it as well. So, how is the CPMG relaxation dispersion pulse sequence affected by pulse imperfections, and how yeah. many pulses are typically applied, and do you need to apply special phase cycles to compensate for imperfection? This is a question, yeah. Fred Perra. Yes. Uh, yes. I mean the CPMG. Especially for uh, for you know when we, sorry I'm, probably I will just stop sharing. Uh, so especially for uh, for the carbon, yeah. So you have a pretty large uh, spectral window right that, that you have to cover. So we do use a, a phase cycling that um, it's uh, the zero zero one three phase cycling. So we use a, a CPMG um, blocks of four pulses. Right, four for refocusing pulses, so that we can use the 0013 phase cycling that is supposed to I mean, has been shown to reduce pulse imperfection. Uh, and we so we apply this um, this sequence on um, um, on uh, mostly on, on phenol. So we only have uh, aromatic carbons, so that we are more or less resonating to a similar uh, ppm, similar frequency. So we do not have a lot of offset to cover. But if you if you really have a very diverse molecule in which you know the uh, you have a big carbon window to cover, I would probably suggest you to measure you know uh, more than one uh, more than one uh, CPMG experiments in which you scan you know the the, uh, the you know the the carbon offset you know to be in resonance with more or less in resonance with as many peaks as you can um, and. That, that's my suggestion because I mean otherwise you will start introducing oscillation into your uh, into into your relaxation dispersion curves right and, and those uh, oscillation they might uh, you know they might introduce feature that you might try to fit but those are, are artificial features so they can really drive off your fits. All right, um, I had a question on. Um... Uh, maybe can you comment on uh, how these experiments can be used potentially for reaction monitoring or titrations example um, for example in cases where you have ligands that are bound to the surface of a nanoparticle and more when you're studying desorption instead of adsorption uh, mm -hmm. so if you add a third uh, reactant in there and then the reactant reacts with some of the ligands on the surface and then they get desorbed or adsorbed uh, mm -hmm. so can you maybe comment on some of that yeah i mean you can uh, uh... Okay, so reactions, you can do that, of course, right? Uh, the, the problem is that you want this, this kind of experiments are, they work best if you have uh, an equilibrium, right? If you have a reaction that, you know, you are continuously um, degrading your subs or your reactant to form the product, right? So it, it would be tough, right, to, to model that, right? Because you, you will have one peak that is continuously increasing in intensity, another one that is continuously decreasing in intensity, right? And uh, so I would say that the challenge would be to keep, to find something that is at equilibrium, right? Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Uh, I think I also had another question about uh, just thinking more about tests. Um, has anybody studied or uh, can you comment on uh, how you could potentially use this for studying uh, liquid solid interfaces, for example? So if you have the interactions between a liquid uh, to solid, I mean, it's kind of a little bit more further extension from thinking about a rigid or a heavy nanoparticle. I, okay. Uh, I do not remember the specifics, but I think Nick Fauci, as you used uh, uh, as used dest to look at um, the exchange uh, of um, um, some proteins from two different phases 
you know, from, uh, uh, from you know, the solution phase and this uh, aqueous phase at this aqueous nano droplet uh, that some of these proteins that he's, he's investigating are um, um, undergo um, form. But you are, you are saying something like this change between uh, a liquid phase formed on, uh, on the top of a solid with the rest of the solution, that's what you're mentioning. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, not aware of uh, of uh, of that's being used for for that. Okay. Yeah, just just curious. I was just kind of thinking more as an extension from the nanoparticle. Mm -hmm. Well, um, you know, there are there are studies in which you know um, that has been used to study. I don't know, protein uh, interacting with chaperones with um, um, membranes. Uh, how you know proteins move on top of membranes or uh, lip liposomes and so on. So, 